welcome to our Easter Reflection this Easter Saturday. I don't know about you, but growing up, I found Easter Saturday a little bit strange, sandwiched as it was between the reflections of Good Friday and the celebrations of Easter Sunday. On the Saturday, no one ever quite knew whether to celebrate or to be sad. And there's very little said about the Saturday in the Gospels either. We're going to read from Luke chapter 23, starting at verse 44. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who'd followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who'd come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So Jesus breathed his last at three o'clock on that afternoon on the first Good Friday, and the large crowd left once Jesus and the thieves had died. Public executions then drew a crowd, and I would imagine that the crowds that earlier had shouted at Pilate for Jesus to be crucified would have gone to see it happen. Luke tells us that after the crowd left, all those who knew Jesus remained and watched what happened next. Now the Sabbath would start at sundown some three hours later, so during that time, Joseph of Arimathea obtains Pilate's permission to go and take Jesus' body for burial and places him in a brand new unused tomb. Mary and the others go and get spices and perfumes and prepare them so that as soon as the Sabbath is over, they can go and complete the burial processes. Then the Sabbath starts and they rest. Probably they went to the synagogue or perhaps to the temple to worship. It would have been strange without Jesus there with them. No work was permitted, so there would have been long hours for grief and reflection. What did they think about what had been happening the last few days and hours? What were they feeling after watching Jesus die on the cross? Was he not really the Messiah after all? What was it all about? What did it all mean? Put yourself in their place for a minute or two. What would you be thinking and feeling? Clearly they hadn't remembered that Jesus had foretold his resurrection on the third day. Otherwise why go and buy expensive spices to anoint his body if they remembered that they wouldn't be needing those? John makes it even clearer when he reports that Peter and he still didn't understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And that was even after they'd seen the folded grave clothes and the empty tomb. In his book God on Mute, Pete Gregg writes, No one really talks about Holy Saturday, yet if we stop and think about it, it's where most of us live most of our lives. Holy Saturday is the no man's land between questions and answers, prayers uttered and miracles to come. It's where we wait with a peculiar mixture of faith and despair whenever God is silent or life doesn't make sense. Do you have days? weeks, months even, when God is silent, when life makes no sense. I think most of us have times like this sooner or later, and we're in good company. Israel toiled in slavery in Egypt and cried out to God for 430 years. It took 430 years of silence before God then spoke and acted. And there are about 400 years of silence between Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, and the birth of Jesus at the start of the New. Martin Luther argued that God withdraws and falls silent in order to draw us into the deeper relationship with him that's only possible when we move past our lived experiences and beyond our own understanding. 
As Paul puts it, we live by faith, not by sight. I know that's easier said than done when we're in the middle of the silence, when nothing makes sense, when life is difficult. But we are in a different place today compared with those at that first Easter. We know what happens tomorrow and we have the benefit of the rest of the New Testament to teach us too. Now silence is the lack of a voice or a sound. Darkness is the absence of light. Silence and darkness are not things in, in themselves. They're the absence of something else, something else that's missing. So how do we seek to bring God's voice into silence or his light into a dark situation? Firstly, we need to remember what God has said. Part of the disciples' confusion arose from the fact that they hadn't remembered what Jesus had told them about his death and then his resurrection on the third day. By contrast, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, he quickly quoted from the Bible. We benefit from reading and remembering God's word, both through the Bible and personally or prophetically. As the psalmist said, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Once we have that truth, it then stays with us in the good times and in the bad times. There's a Red Collective song which says, what's true in the light is still true in the dark. Our circumstances, good or bad, don't change God's truth. And secondly, we can remember what God has done. And that's not just to tell a good story about things that have happened in the past, but so that our memory inspires faith for how God can act in our current circumstances. In Acts 1 verse 3, Luke tells us that Jesus gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Many, not just one or two. Jesus was keen that we should know that they should know beyond doubt that he had risen from the dead. This will be so important to them over time as they face challenges. And it's important to us too. It's important that we remember what God has already done, particularly if we can't see God at work at the moment. In the Old Testament, people set up markers or built altars as a reminder of things that God had done. What helps you and me to remember what God has done? So we remember what God has said and we remember what God has done. And then we trust and we hope and we wait for him patiently. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your promise that you are with us always, even in the silence and the dark situations we experience. Help us to draw closer to you, to place our trust and our hope in you. Help us to rely patiently on you, your faithfulness, not on our own experience or our own understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>